So I'm Larry Bloom. I'm uh, an economist. Uh, I studied uh, at Washington University and Berkeley back in the day. I'm a theorist, I should say. I became interested in economics because my sophomore year in college, I read Ken Arrow's book, Social Choice and Individual Values. And I didn't find the answers at all convincing, but I thought it was just tremendous that one could formulate precisely the questions that Ken asked, that you could think about what makes, a, what makes a good government, what makes a good constitution, and think about it in this very powerful abstract way. So that just, that just swept me away and, and got me hooked in economics. And the following summer, um, I read Gerard de Bruce's book, uh, Theory of Value, which is a, uh, one of the urtexts of general equilibrium theory. And again, I became completely enamored of this line of reasoning. I love thinking about large systems and how all these things come together. Um, seeing the invisible hand actually worked out formally. And after that, I was just hooked um, and therefore went off to graduate school so that I could write a thesis with Deborah, uh, who wrote Theory of Value. And, um, and here I am. I have to say that the, those early questions still, to me, are really compelling. So my research project for the future, not what I'm working on now, but something that I really plan on working on before I'm finished, um, is to uh, think hard about welfare economics. It's interesting that not just me, but many other people in my cohort had the same experience of being really turned on to economics by, by social choice and individual values, by social choice theory in general. And then none of us went on to write in social choice theory, and social choice theory actually died as an active research area not long after we were reading this book in the uh, early 70s. Um, um, and yet, uh, welfare economics is probably the weakest part of the foundations of economics, and yet it's really central to what we do. Anytime you go to a talk, people say, well, what are the welfare effects of this policy? And I think that there's, we actually have no way to think about it. And what we tell students in our classes, what we sell them on, is just nonsense. So I'm very eager to, to think about that. I am still actually very interested in and working on general equilibrium theory. We talk a lot about uh, why markets are good, right? And we have this idea called uh, complete markets. And in uh, the world of complete markets, I'm not going to explain this here, but in the world of complete markets, right, we teach that everything is welfare optimal, the market works, the invisible hand picks up what it's supposed to pick up and puts down what it's supposed to pick down. It's a grand thing. In some of my recent research, um, I have been uh, together with uh, David Easley, my colleague at Cornell, Tom Sargent at NYU, um, uh, a couple of other colleagues, we have been thinking about uh, why complete markets are not such good things. And, and this actually gets into this question of what's wrong with the welfare economics that we teach. We have developed a little critique of incomplete markets and it's really fun to talk about it, go give seminars, because people are completely outraged that you could say complete markets are a bad thing. Um, and uh, so I'm having a very good time with that. And in general, I've been interested for a long time in um, the effects of heterogeneity uh, in markets. You know, the whole point of markets is that diverse individuals with very different tastes, very different interests, very different beliefs about the world come together and, um, and trade and exchange. Um, and yet many of the models that we build to talk about, say, macroeconomic phenomena um, assume that people are very much alike in key ways. This seems to me to be um, kind of uh, throwing out the interesting part of the exercise. And much of my research in general equilibrium theory over the last 20 years has had to do with the effects of um, what happens when you try to keep it interesting. Also particularly interested in um, enriching the way that we uh, view economic life. So um, through um, my involvement uh, with the HCEO and before that with the uh, MacArthur Foundation Working Group and um, other similar activities, um, I have become, uh, ex I was exposed to and become very interested in what we can learn from other social sciences. And in particular, I'm interested in the way in which economic life is embedded in, in, in our larger structures of social life and how that might affect um, uh, the conclusions that we draw from our economic models. Uh, I find the HCEO activities exciting because it's an easy way to uh, keep up contacts in these different areas and learn about a lot of a lot of a lot of interesting things. So, 
particular, I've become interested and have written a bit on, on social networks. I collaborate at Cornell um, with a, uh, a group of economists and computer scientists. I found, uh, I found it very exciting to both learn new methods and learn also very different questions than economists might typically ask by talking with my computer science colleagues, um, who themselves are becoming very good social sciences, so scientists. So this is, a, this is a very fruitful interaction. I think that the future of, um, of economic research for me, and hopefully for other economic theorists, um, is broadening ourselves rather than writing uh, um, uh, to each other for each other um, uh, writing out of each other, um, we should be looking at what's going on in these larger areas and uh, areas around us and trying to, to enrich the domain of, in, uh, of discourse. And, and uh, So if I had to guess what the future of economics would be, um, at least in economic theory, uh, that's, where I, that's where I put my vote.